information for you to consider, uh, to think about, and to help you make your decisions with. First of all, if you're eating anything out of the Pacific Ocean, you have not been listening to this program, and you are begging for big, big trouble. Big trouble. First of all, Yoshi is not going to be here tonight. Uh, He's traveling. He's back in Southeast Asia. He'll be with us next week or the week after. And now we get to go to British Columbia, to the other part of our fabulous uh, team of uh, heroic individuals who are taking on the entire nuclear power industry, trying to help us all understand what uh, most of you who have been listening already get. We are confronting the worst catastrophe in human history, as far as we know, and it is called Fukushima. Now, I'm going to tell you some things in a couple minutes that are going to just, uh, they're going to amaze you. All right. This is really bad. And it it will back up and underscore. It's actually understating what Dana Dernford has already found out and established. He proved that most aquatic life, most marine life from mammals all the way down to crustaceans and algae uh, have been already eliminated, eradicated. Uh, They're gone. They have been wiped out all along the West Coast, certainly along the Canadian West Coast, and moving on down into Washington, Oregon, and Southern California. It's moving moving its way all the way down. Dana, are you there? I am, Jeff. Thank you very kind. I am so. You're welcome. How are you? I'm reasonably good. It's uh, it's tough, tough times. Oh, I know. I agree. You know, that Fukushima, like you're saying, uh, yeah, you know, you got a couple of stories there tonight you want to get into, I know. Yeah. And Yoshi was uh, going to cover the big blob. Um, we can touch upon that, too. Uh, yeah. That's something he mentioned a long time ago. Uh, and if you look at that map, I've got the story up. You look look on the right side column, right next to news, and the huge Fukushima news box and the full archive going back over five years, it's there. It's right near the top. It's uh, a warm water blob in the Pacific Ocean. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But this is something that really, really got my attention. We all know about cancer. We know that cancer can be caused by a lot of different factors, some of which are readily available in the environment, some are are in the food chain, uh, some are lifestyle, some may be genetic. We don't know, although I kind of doubt that in most cases. Uh, It's usually an environmentally or lifestyle acquired uh, condition and it is it is quite easily reversible in most cases but what we have now is something that is unique we have an admission by the national geographic and a couple of other major news organizations that there is a form of cancer now in the pacific ocean along the west coast that it is it is uh, undeniably infectious infectious now think about that it's not a question of uh, 8 million fish of a certain species uh, coming down with cancer from eating the same kind of, of tainted food. This is an infectious, as in a virus or a bacteria. Of course, Royal Raymond Reif in the 1930s made it quite clear that cancer is caused by a bacteria or a virus. A virus, a bacteria, a mold, a yeast, a fungus, they're all the same things just manifesting different configurations depending upon the actual environment in which they're existing, the human body. If your body is extremely acid, it may manifest as uh, some kind of a mold or a yeast or a fungal infection. Uh, if you're more alkaline and you've got uh, the cancer issue going, it may show up as a bacterial marker or a viral marker. Okay, but now we've got something that is infectious. That means it's spread easily in the environment of the Pacific Ocean. And they're talking about clams and shellfish. However, I would suggest that it doesn't stop there, that this infectious organism, this malignant organism, can easily invade other life forms at other levels of, well, we could call them the food chain. Uh, Here's what National Geographic has to say. It sounds like the plot of a summer horror movie. Malignant cells floating in the ocean, ferrying infectious cancer everywhere they go. I'm going to read that again. Please pay attention to this. It sounds like the plot of a summer horror movie. Malignant cells floating in the sea, ferrying infectious cancer 
everywhere they go. The story is all too true, say scientists, who have made a discovery they call beyond surprising. I think that's an understatement. Outbreaks of leukemia that have devastated populations of soft-shell clams along the east coast of the U.S. and Canada are the result of cancerous tumor cells making their way from one clam to another. The evidence indicates that the tumor cells themselves are contagious, that they can spread from one clam to another in the ocean, says such and such biochemist and immunologist. Um, We go on from there. Let me pull this down. This week, the team reported new findings in the journal Nature. The transmissible cancer has been discovered in three more bivalve species, mussels in West Vancouver, Canada, cockles in Spain, and golden carpet shell clams also in Spain. All right, what have you just learned? That this infectious form of cancer is on the Atlantic East Coast, Europe, the European coast, it's on the Atlantic West Coast, and it's on the Pacific West Coast, as it were. It's actually our East Coast in the middle there, but we've got it in the Atlantic, we've got it in the Pacific. How did it get there? What caused these cells to become transmissible and floating uh, contaminants that can kill soft shell, clams, mussels? Uh, and you you see, you can include oysters, any of these uh, types of uh, animals. I'm going to suggest that they're not going to take a look at yet birds, fish, mammals, and other animals in the ocean who may also come down with some kind of cancer from this this malignant organism. Dana, you know about this. You're all over it. Um, how how big of a shock does this come to you? Probably not much. Uh, and I, I think that we can both identify the causal factor of this transmissible form of cancer pretty easily. Well, the big surprise is they found mussels. <laughs> I got pictures of the whole coastline they're missing. And yeah. they found now, you know, when you think about it in other countries, but 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 it, they call it the leukemia. Now leukemia is a bone cancer. Right, it's it's from plutonium That's strontium, right. That's right. emitters going into your bones and mutating your stem cells. And mussels don't have that structure at all. They don't have bones in them anywhere. They have a shell around or and they're soft as you can get on the inside. And they have an iodine sac attached to them. So they aggregate iodine uh, naturally, radi- and so they would aggregate the same as kelp uh, iodine, man-made iodine the same way. And, uh, you know, I've done a whole coastline, so I really don't know what they're talking about. I'm so confused with everything that everybody's saying. I've read through it and read through it and when looked at these people and um, the guy you were talking about so and so Jeff uh, he's in Nanaimo uh, right across from me uh, or the guy he's talking about is right across from me uh-huh. um, yeah and so he's with Fisheries and Oceans is where this is a guy they brought in rather than the guy from Fisheries and Oceans who was doing the study right and so he's a Canadian he's actually from Vancouver originally the original guy. Stephen and Goff. It's, it's, just, it's really you, you confusing know, yeah, because, yeah. Um, you know, if you go down anywhere on the coastline, you can find six or seven species. Uh, it'll be the same species I found, certainly, and that's about all you're going to find there. Well, they got a picture so, here. You saw it. The mussels at Copper Beach in West Vancouver, Canada, are yeah. infected with the disease. A little small picture, yeah. And Not there a big are spots along the coastline yeah. where there was mussels, uh, absolutely. But it, like in the context of mussels, uh, we're maybe uh, 1% to 1% to 1% of what it should be out there. Every rock that's available should be covered in mussels. Well, as I look at the picture, these are the only yeah. mussels I see anywhere. Yeah, and there's nothing else there. Maybe nothing. The a little bit of green. Yeah, a little and green. And the green Just a little. cabbage, uh, kelp, out of the 600 algaes. And this, uh, but you know, no big surprise because it's right by a city with a couple of millions. So you know, but the rest of the coast is actually the same thing, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So normally it wouldn't be a big surprise there was much there because of all the pollution, obviously. And and but the big thing is that how does leukemia and how does this translate out when they talk about how it now managed to find its way all the way to Spain the and Spain, and yeah. so this uh, now uh, bivalves. And, you know, clams and mussels, for instance, uh, these are filter feeders and starfish will eat them. That's why starfish now 
say fish magnify radionuclides uh, 10, 20,000 uh, times. But uh, clams and stuff like that, uh, filter feeders are 100 and 120,000 times. Okay, now filter and, feeder is a, an animal that takes in seawater and strains from it uh, nutrients. That's the theory anyway. Right, and... Right, and they're grabbing the phytoplankton, the, the basis right. of the food chain, the oxygen, the carbon sequestering chain, these microscopic animals. We, we can possibly, most likely not see with your naked eye, but a drop of water would have thousands of them in them, and glass would have a billion in the ocean. Uh-huh. And so the fish is constantly just filtering through that, and that's just that smorgasbord of different. Imagine, right. you know, how many different right. animals they're eating because they're, they're not they're indiscriminate with their uh, the way they filter feed. It's just like a little tentacles, little uh, fl- um, like a little flower coming out of them, microscopic. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the starfish would normally feed on them. And they got wiped out because they were eating stuff that was bioaccumulating. But starfish also uses the ocean water. Uh, like we use blood. And uh, so these are very vulnerable parts of the ocean. That's why, like I said, done the expeditions were in the tidal zones in particular and everything else we can look at at the same time. And that the tidal pools were telling tale anyway because their health, they would have been first affected because they're, they're the filter feeders. And so they would have, you know, tuna is way up the food chain. And whales, of course, are unique in the sense of where they're eating uh, krill and, you know, they're krill are not that far up the food chain, but they are quite a long ways up where they converted the energy, but they would eat the krill in the herring and krill are like shrimp for anybody that doesn't understand and anchovies and stuff like that. Very small, tiny fish. Uh, and, you know, uh, they're dependent upon that as a diet. And so they starved to death, along with the half a million birds recently. They also starved to death. And there was uh, 48 whales along the coastline last year or so, probably more than that, actually 50-something. But uh, normally there's only eight dies on the coastline. And uh, over 48 had starved to death. And they went from, say, 12 inches of blubber to four inches of blubber. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so um, mm. same thing with the birds. And the birds came ashore, couldn't find anything in the tidal zones, went in the woods, couldn't find the insects, went into the interior lakes. And there was up to 8,000 in one corner of an Alaskan lake of saltwater mers. And they can dive up to 600 feet in salt water. So if they couldn't find it out there. Now... You know, like you say, the pictures are up at the nuclearproctologist.org. They're free for everybody. You can make documentaries with that, and you can monitorize that. And that's for everybody, because who was going to go out and do that and then supply that documentation for people? And so that's why we've done it the way we've done it, is it's free for anybody to use uh, to tell that story or even to uh, harass me if they want to. I don't really care. No, no, you know, any news is good news in this context. We We had an event and this event has, has uh, unbelievable consequences so far. And um, it's almost a um, nightmare that that you can never wake up from, Jeff, right? You yeah. know, yourself, oh, you've yeah. been running that yeah. center, you've been running that center page uh, with everything you got. And uh, the, the opposition is out there constantly, um, you know, they just come out with a new recent last week with a whole load of uh, the ocean is going to be back to normal by 2020 radionuclides are going to drop themselves down and that all came from an Australian and he's not really an Australian he's from Belgium he's only been in Australia about a year and he's got 174 studies under his belt and uh, these are all tracers um, so he's been at it a long time so it's really interesting that everybody just all of a sudden ran with this story about an Australian when he's actually just a transplant Belgium you know mm-hmm. And uh, that story now is disappearing because nobody really believes it, never got no traction. Everybody on the planet has woken up in one sense. They really have. You're seeing this awakening, but everybody's still stupefied on what their options are. And, uh, you know, how do you tell people you got to give up uh, the coastline? How do, you, how do you tell the people in the Pacific Rim nations that they, the moral and ethical thing? Exactly. And the the yeah. future will be to get away from that coastline. Yeah. Yeah, because it's liberated all the time. It's constantly yep. going yep. into it. That ocean is only going to get worse every single day because uh, we can't find the coriums. We can't find the reactor cores. We, we, we How many tons are missing, uh, Dana? Go ahead. How many tons are missing of fuel you can't well, 13, find? 13,500 tons <clears throat> per reactor. That's 5 million pounds per reactor, not counting what was on the roof. And there was 10 yeah. years worth of fuel on the roof. And so minimum, there was uh, <laughs> around 25 million pounds in each of these buildings. Insanity. Total sort of insane. Go ahead. 
it's in, it's beyond belief that people would design a structure like that to put the nuclear waste that has to be shepherded and watched for at least 50,000 years minimum, four to five stories off the ground, in a steel building that's going to rot. Show me a building 50,000 years old, folks, please. Uh, I mean, they, they uh, anyway, I didn't want to go in there. Go ahead. And so, Makes like the sick. muscles, uh, they call it leukemia, and they have referred to it as leukemia. As leukemia but it's really not cancer. leukemia. That's really weird. No, it's, yeah. it's a, it, maybe they're referring to it as a blood leukemia. I don't know. And the fact that they're even saying that the mollusks, uh, which is almost extinct now, they don't bother mention that part of it, is just all smells of the local population has woken up. And in British Columbia, most people have this history of going down in the summer times and getting their hands on mussels. And a lot of their children, because these are privileged people in, in uh, the government, and British Columbia has a lot of government here. It's the capital mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for government. And so, you know, they would have went down and ate mussels growing up. And now they don't want to tell their children the truth. And so they roll out stuff like this. And so now they show their children that and their children are like, ooh, that's scary. I don't want to eat that. I got cancer. When... Because they've never seen it before, and now they're uh, looting that it's uh, – because this is one and the same. What they're saying in Spain, what they're saying about the Atlantic has everything to do with what happened in Japan. Japan wasn't just – like, you know, Jeff, yourself, of course. But Japan wasn't isolated to the Pacific. Uh, it circled the planet every 40 days and never stopped coming out of there. The never. plume was right across the Pacific and the width of the Pacific, right across North America, the width of North America, right across the Atlantic, the width of the North Atlantic, and right across Europe and the width of it. And so that never stopped going out. After about 40 days, we had a continuous, invisible cloud right around the entire planet. And the reason we say stuff like that is because a gram of it can produce so much, so many. It's so compact. It's, there's uh, 88 times 37 billion killer um, atoms per gram. And wow. you're talking about millions and millions wow. of atoms that were in wow. reactors, multiple reactors. And you're talking about uh, fuel pools that were supposed to be protected for millions of years because they have the same material, but you can't use it for fissionable energy anymore, but it's still volatile to the end of time. Then you had all of the fuel that was in the common spin fuel pools on the ground, and you mm-hmm. had waste sites mm-hmm. uh, throughout that 400 kilometers of the coastline that was put to a wood chipper by that tsunami, along with uh, around 50 nuclear power plants. And that the, the, the excuse is that the other plants didn't melt down range from insane to, um, like they would say stuff like, oh, you know, um, they admit that the buildings were flooded with water. They admit that they lost all the power there, but they ran a cable into the <laughs> But the buildings were destroyed, right. and so where are you going to plug it in? And yeah. yeah, right. And so you got all of these things that don't really add up. And then you have incredible amount of radiation with 30 million bags picked up just in a small area around the Fukushima prefecture. Yeah. And where are and those yeah, bags now, Dana? 30 million and that they're only meant to last a couple of years at most. And they're sitting in piles all over right, the place. Right, up to 10,000 separate dumps with over 30 million one-ton bags. That's, uh, four and the plastic is breaking down. It's, all, I look, there, it's, Japan is... It's, From four buildings. And uh, a lot more than this would have went to the ocean, of course, but it never stopped coming out of there. These are breeder reactors. These are producing more than what was originally put in there because of the chain reaction. Mm-hmm. It's able to consume everything you throw at it. And then all the water that runs over the fissionable products, uh, the tri- what they call tritium, is fissionable products. Calling it tritium is just another way of blowing it off like they've always done uh, with that manipulation. But this is really serious stuff. This is x-rays and neutrons. So, and ma- yeah, of- now, calling it tritium is misdirection. There's so it much so. more to it. It's the ridiculous. The water itself is radiated, just like a screwdriver becomes radiated on a car battery. And so, like... And I'm starting to use this new way of explaining it to people. Because you hear these comparisons of natural radiation and man-made radiation. But a gram of man-made could power a million flashlights at one watt each. And Mm. it can power it for nine months. Mm. And so the difference between a gram of man-made is is one is a million and a natural is none. And the, the natural stuff couldn't mutate any fruit flies. But the gram of uh, man-made stuff, after it went through that chain reaction, Uh if people were to pass it around and hang on to it, say, for 10 minutes at a time, 15 minutes at a time, well, they'll be dead by then. And at some point down the road, everybody would be dead. 
But if you atomize the neurosol that gram out, that's enough to kill if you distribute out the atoms everybody on the planet in increments over decades. Right. Because it takes that long for that effect to happen. And it's in the air right now. All, right. all, all over the place. All California around the with 360 in the testicles, atoms per day breathed in. 300, so, say that again. 360 uh, sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyballs. These are little nuclear engines. And each, that's the average intake of each human being in for, California. For the males. Oh my. And for the women, what I went to the uteruses and breast. Um, it's got a tendency to aggregate and uh, throughout the body, of course, right. and depending what the particles was. These in particular went into the muscles, allegedly, if you can believe these people. But the numbers in California were 1,500 per cubic meter uh, sustained. And in, in the Seattle, air. Uh, in the these air. were hot particles, yeah. One cubic meter of air. All right, that's right. nine feet by nine feet by nine feet, right? Yeah, that's right. And so everybody's walking around in that little box, so to speak. Yeah. And if you're jogging, you're breathing more, you know. If you're working, the kids that were close to the ground, this stuff was known to suspend itself close to the ground, be reliberated in the morning dew and fog and stuff ah, like that. Just yeah. and, and it's not salutable in water and it's easily uh, liberated. It's not like uh, where cesium would go into the plants and be uptake into the roots and it really gets down there and it doesn't go away and, it, and then it ionizes everything as it's going past it. And that's the, uh, the inherent problem with radiation. It has that ability to radiate everything. Uh, really? Just so the, it just, just physically passing by, it can leave a signature radiation after effect behind it? It can so, yeah. Yeah, not only that, if the air is full of it and it's beaming out uh, two and three feet, yeah. then in a sense, everything is getting irradiated because it's pounding into everything, whatever touches it. Or Non-stop. It's like that's a why your Geiger counter picks it up. So. It's like a 360-degree uh, machine gun that never stops firing. Right. Yeah, and it does that till the end of time, and it does that every second. Okay, that's what we've done to our planet. Now, we're going to take a break here, but let me just wrap up this first half hour with Dana. Uh, you don't want to be eating any shellfish, that means clams, mussels, anything like that. And we'll, we'll talk about the potential of this floating infectious carcinogen, this floating infectious cancer in the ocean, and how it may impact other species when we come back in just a few minutes. This is not a joke. Okay, and we're back with Dana Dernford and nuclearproctologist.org. Please take a look. This is, uh, this is really scary stuff. This is like science fiction, okay? Really follow carefully. Cancer is supposed to be self-limiting because it kills its hosts. All right? Now, in mussels in the ocean... Something new has happened. Cancer has become contagious, like a virus or a bacteria. All along the western Canadian coast, mussels are dying. Their blobby bodies are swollen by tumors. The blood-like fluid that fills their interiors is clogged with malignant cells. They are all sick with the same thing, cancer, and it seems to be spreading. For all its harrowing, terrifying damage, the saving grace of cancer, as I said, has always been that it dies with its host. Its destructive power comes from turning victims' own cells against them and making them run amok. But when molecular biologist Stephen Goff biopsied these muscles, he found something strange. The tumor cells didn't have the same DNA as their host, Instead, every muscle was being killed by the same line of cancerous cells. 
which were jumping from one individual to the next like a virus would. The mussels, as well as two other species of bivalves, clams, examined by Goff and his colleagues, are dying from contagious cancer. This is a first. Now imagine if cancer were contagious in human beings, like a virus or a bacteria. It very well may end up being just that. could be spread by any body fluids, kiss, sex, sneezing, coughing. That's what we might be facing. Goff's study, which was published in the journal Nature, doubles the number of species known to suffer from transmissible cancers. And in one case, clams were being killed by cancer cells that came from an entirely different species. It's cross-jumping species. Species jumping. Big warning. Big warning. How do we know this is going to stop with bivalves, with clams? It's not. It's already being transmitted cross species. Where does it end, Dana? If we had a headline out that said uh, apples are all got cancer and it is mutated and might go to bananas and oranges and grass and shrubbery and will we move out of our homes? Will we tear up our lands? Um, I don't know, right? Uh, would all yeah. the animals all of a sudden get the cancer from eating that? And so they don't go down roads like that or anything like that. And they should have. They could have. They would have normally. You would expect that. You would, you know, that narrative. Like if I'm here in British Columbia and, and I see that, I'm not going to be eating no mussels anymore, whether I know anything about Fukushima or not. I'm just not going to be eating anything out of that coastline water. That that would freak you out, right? That would, that's Absolutely. Not. You know, this whole this whole thing. Uh, you the, own the, the house there? The, the, do I? No, I'm just saying, have you ever seen the coastline? Like, it's all houses. It's all just like... Oh, I know. I know. I, I think 15... What is it? I, what, some, some enormous percent of the world population lives within 50, 20 miles of the coast or something. I don't know what it's it is. It's unbelievable. The whole coastline is just... The first it's contagious cancer... And then was, can't eat the mussels. <laughs> no. Well, the, I mean... You know, what if your kids are going down playing on the beaches all the time? That's what they do out here, right? Or what about this? What about? I mean, the beaches are the focal points of every single community. Yeah, and they're all dead. total transmission vector. We don't know if humans can can uh, derive a cancer from this kind of so organism. Go, yeah, they're, but they're not the saying what it is. Thing. See, they're don't not saying beaches, but no. They're, okay in your house. See, that yeah, doesn't that make that sense. Makes no sense. No, none. Go ahead, Jeff. No, it makes no sense. They're not saying what these cancer. Cells are this. What is this transmissible cancer? They're so not saying. Cancer. Is it is it a, a bacteria? <laughs> not, not a muscle, but is, of the cell. Show, show is that sick? That's right. Is so it like a virus? Going, that's what everybody would be out there going. Oh, it's like the greatest discovery ever made. Instead of the media's like, like I wouldn't have heard about it if E and E News didn't poke it up there. I wouldn't have caught it. I was and I'm scanning constantly. I, I'm like a, a bot on the internet for goodness' mm -hmm. sakes. I spent today. I probably read 300 studies today for goodness' sakes. And, I mean, peer review studies. And it's just this, uh, I have this voracious, unbelievable appetite lately for the last couple of years, especially since, well, since I come off the ocean, it's like been unhinged and I don't even understand it. But uh, I'm absorbing as much as I can, collecting everything I can. Well, you're, and as I, they say, you're lit. I am, so I'm switched on. Um, yeah. Hey, this headline is a translation, so I'm not, I'm not sure if you'll find it, but you should be able to find it. Japan National Cancer Center says number of patients rose by 865,000 in 2012. One year. year after the worst number since mm -hmm. World War II. Mm -hmm. So that's a rough translation from a Japanese newspaper. Yeah. So but, uh, rose by 865,000 when they've been saying in the first year, and they've been saying it hasn't. Now, a study pre-Fukushima 2001 on children thyroid now, cancer shouldn't show up till late down the road anyway, but 1,800 diseases should first. But uh, studies on thyroid pre-Fukushima 2001 uh, showed 0.8% uh, of a percent. And uh, uh, shortly after, about a year and a half after the accident was uh, 13,600 out of 40,000 children had serious thyroid issues and blamed on the radiation. That, that was suppressed by people like 
Kathleen Higley from America, professor oh, of course. radiation. You never see the word radiation. Tim Thomas from in- the UK, ex- experts. Uh, they actually uh, peer reviewed these studies, got them sitting, some of them on a shelf. And so that's the problem with studies anyway. It gets locked up behind a paywall shortly after. You, you won't find in any of these stories I've been quoting uh, the word radiation or Fukushima. Nowhere. None of it. Here's one more uh, paragraph. Listen. I guess that many of the cancers that are known will turn out to be this type, said Goff, talking about the contagious cancer, who is based at Columbia University Medical Center. How many other marine species might turn out to suffer from this? We don't really know. Cross-species infectivity is an unknown. That was my last sentence. But they don't know. The point is, this could literally spread to every living thing in the ocean. Now, they said the same thing uh, in 2015 in April. The National Geographic had about uh, sea urchins. And they said sea urchins uh, were affected by the same disease, apparently, as the starfish, is what they were claiming. And because that's a big family besides those two, uh, there's a lot of uh, species, you know, like those little, there's so many species of starfish. And, yeah, and, well, so for our listeners, there are virtually no starfish li- list, uh, left. Uh, there are no sea urchins left uh, compared to what right. they used to be. They're almost all gone. And so anyway, National Geographic and the Smithsonian, before I forget, had said that, uh, that looked like an extinction event for the sea urchins at that stage. So you had uh, the major uh, visible ones, which was the starfish, the sea urchin, and now the mussels. And But also, this one would drive you away from mussels instantly. You'll be like, oh, oh, you know, I'm not touching. That just, that would freak the average person who doesn't understand anything about it. Regardless, that will freak them out. And so... Government officials will have no problem because they'll show that to their loved ones. And then, you know, my daddy's this or my mommy's that or my uncle's this or my nanny's that. And so uh, this is probably what they're up to. They're taking care of their own. They got a history of that. And this this is just a good way of them finally being able to get their loved ones without admitting that they're lying murderers Mm -hmm. because that's what these people do. I mean, we had the radiation numbers in Vancouver of 200 and 20 million becquels per liter of rainwater of iodine 129 with a 15 million year half. Like this is not like the stuff from the solar system. This is from a chain reaction. It's uh, that's why we have uh, terrorist laws and, and we're, we're, we have nuclear holding sites, not waste sites because we don't know what to do with it. But that's the significance there is that it's a tool for them that uh, their their friends and families and loved ones, they need to convince they don't have to give up the game on Fukushima mm-hmm. and they blame it on. That's my uh, opinion strongly because I've done the whole coastline and the species are not there anyway, see? Right. And right. so that will keep them away from even going out and exploring the coastline. That's right. That's right. And families, That's right. Which is a huge hobby. If you drive through any community here, every house or every second or third house for sure, got a speedboat or a big boat or a yacht and the wharfs are full of yachts and speedboats and they're always out there every time the wind stops they're gone that's the favorite hobby in British Columbia so and this is just a national pastime here if you want to look at it that way I mean that in every sense of the world because we are we wear our sneakers all year round here and we're the only spot in Canada you can do that you're a banana and, belt almost I guess right <clears throat> and uh but we're also the coastline is kept warm by the warm waters from Japan, and you got maybe yes, say they're, they're, they've never been warmer, have they? <laughs> no, they rose up seven degrees. We got that warm blob out there, Jeff. You got that story? Yeah, we'll get to. Let me do that in just a minute. Uh, one more qu- quote from this story: Goff, the scientist from Columbia, and his colleagues found a third example of this contagious cancer last year in softshell clams living along the Atlantic coast. A colleague working at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, not our favorite place, asked him to come take a look at her dying clams, which she thought were suffering from a virus. Instead, they were all dying from a form of bivalve leukemia. Let's call it what it is, cancer, bivalve cancer, infectious, contagious bivalve cancer. It's in the water. It's in the Atlantic. It's in the Pacific. And if you folks eat anything... Any more from the oceans, you're rolling the dice. Good luck. The radiation and don't get you the country. They will not tell you until it's almost too late. 
In fact, it will be too late for a lot of people. Anything that's left out there is bioaccumulated, like you can't imagine. Just because the fish are out there you got swimming it. around don't mean they're not full of radiation. Just because people can still find mussels and a few clams on the coastline and gooey ducks and scallops and and other species, does that mean that they're not, they don't bioaccumulate and they, that they didn't? And when you look in the context of the expedition showed an extinction event of, of almost all the species for a hundred of them, then the ones that are left are saturated and that the, the effects, because they, they're prolonged before they actually show up and manifest right. in the context where we, we won't even try to diagnose it because we won't admit it. And so we, we don't include that in the scope of uh, what's going on with people's health issues right now. We don't say, well, that dementia could be from all the radi- radioactive fish you've been eating and all the mussels and scallops that you've been picking up on the coastline in Canada. And we don't bring it up in context of the of the health effects that people are showing up with, because that'll show up before the cancer. Now, we're not cancer telling you, cancer. we're not saying that this is, you're eating radiation. What we're saying is that right. we're eating something that is the result right. of radiation. <laughs> it has caused this cancer to turn into, a, I'll call it a virus, a floating carcinogenic infectious well, cancerous virus. I'm going to twist this one up a little tiny bit. If you were to go and, okay, well, I know this is a weird one. But if remember it, Royal it, Rife did prove that cancer was, in fact, they called it a, a, the BX virus. Right. Anyway, that was in the 30s. They should running and screaming when he found it in the Atlantic. They oh, they should have. Right? Absolutely. That's what should have normally happened when you wouldn't expect it. It would be like looking at a meteor oh, coming I, I at you. Would. Hey, by the way, folks, we got a, <laughs> we got something that could jump. Speed. This is such hey, an enormous zip, story. You know? It's such a huge story. I got another one for you. This is uh, Yoshi's been talking about this. Uh, a, they, here's the headline. A rare blob of unusually warm water that did massive damage to California all of its marine life, has re-emerged. No, it hasn't re-emerged. It never went away. It just changed positions in the ocean. They stopped reporting about it. It's a little bit deeper now. It's back. While this year's El Nino wasn't as bad as meteorologists were expecting, there's something else wreaking havoc on North America's marine ecosystems. A huge mass of warm water off the Pacific coast, nicknamed by University of Washington meteorologist Nick Bond, La Blob. All right, it's not a creature from a horror flick, but it might as well be from marine scientists. It's warm water, and they're blaming that for killing off all these animals. Well, where did this warm water come from? And if you look at the map of it, and I've got there's a, the stories and headlines. Just look for warm water killing marine life on California's west coast or the North America's west coast. You look at the warm water. You've seen this map, Dana, haven't you? And it shows right off the coast of Oregon, Washington. It shows right where the uh, the North that Pacific Current. Miles. It shows where the North Pacific Current splits. It goes north and south up into the Gulf of Alaska. Two very dense and, and thick red areas, both north and south, especially going to the north toward you. This is supposedly warm water. Well, funniest thing, it looks very much like the concentration of radioactivity from <laughs> Fukushima. Excuse very me. much. You're right by saying that. Yeah, and, and, and look, if you got an ice cube and or ice and you put it in a cooler and you take that cooler, you put it in another cooler, you take that cooler, you put it in another cooler and you do that 10 times and then you bring it down into a hot springs like, you know, Yellowstone or whatever and you put it down in that, that ice will melt not too long later. And so when you take this big blob and, and like, so the ocean works this way, you have different salinity at different depths, and then you have different temperatures at different depths. And you can't change that factor, even if it's a 1,000 square miles. uh, So now you're looking at a bunch of ice down a lot deeper that's surrounded by nothing but cold water. And I say that because when I'm diving, say if I'm going down at 100 foot, well, I got to wear a 10 millimeter suit because it gets really cold. Now, if I'm going down to 200 foot, I got to wear a couple of pair of underwear and then I got to wear a special like stuff you would wear uh, for skiing, really thin underwear. And I would pile all that on top. Wow. My gloves would have a couple of pair of gloves. And then what do you put? What do you fit? What are you collecting that. down that deep? Uh, well, I've done salvage and I've done construction and huh. not, not for harvest. Harvesting is normally no deeper than, say, 90 feet. If you were harvesting. I haven't heard anything that deep. Yeah, you okay. burn nine tanks a day doing that one. Because a tank don't last very long, right? 
Hmm. And so you spend all day sitting around waiting to get an extra 10 or 20 minutes on your tables. And you go down and get five or 10 minutes, at 70, 80, 90 feet. And so there are crazy days, but there's crazy money too. Unbelievable amounts of money. Um, there used to be. Now the blob, think about the blob. When that blob, the ocean currents that are bringing the warm water over and keeping the coastline in North America, regulating the temperature from Japan to direct roots of the radiation 45 days later. But... That's warm water that travels at a certain depth and a certain, you know, at the surface, say, and a certain depth. Okay, so that comes all the way over and still maintains some of its warmth and that keeps the coastline here warm. Well, when you take a blog and you bring it down really deep like that, it's it's like surrounding it. And I mean, we're talking, you can make your own ice cubes down there at that depth. Wow. With fresh water. Mm -hmm. And so when you take a blob and you bring it down in that depth, it's surrounded by water, but it is changing its salinity and it's changing its speed. There's different speeds as you go down through the layers. And so this defies, this is what a uranium would do, though. Like a uranium cloud will just sit over the city like it did in Baghdad. The big you, mean, you mean when the United States, States was liberating Baghdad and yeah, Iraq yeah, from yeah, it, that evil it. Saddam Hussein? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And But anyway, there was this cloud that hung out there for about six or seven days and just hung there. Mm -hmm. This was a uranium cloud. That's what a uranium clouds will do. And even though all the other clouds were being, being blown away, even though it wasn't a lot of wind, but it was still being blown away, this thing just sat there. And people had uh, mentioned that the reporters had said, well, I don't know why that cloud is still there. <laughs> But that's what it was. It was a depleted uranium dolram, depleted uranium low-level radioactive. But that, that was contaminated with everything. So the blob off the coastline is still there, basically. And it was looking at heating up the ocean seven degrees hotter where it was. And this is these temperatures is what caused those uh, the Philippines to lose 30 uh, million coconut trees and turn them into projectiles. And they lost 41 provinces. And this storm that hit the Philippines a couple of years ago, uh, it was land speeds over 200 sustained miles per hour, 225 uh, gust miles per hour. These are, we've never seen that on land before. And they've done the same thing to Tonga and uh, Vanuatu and Fiji, and Mexico, and just recently now in China, uh, where if you go searching through it, you'll find it to hit those numbers too. These are phenomena. China, of course, is not that far away. These are phenomena that we've never we've seen before till uh, and only in the Pacific. And all, a lot of them had, seem to have a relationship with Japan's waters or the waters that's coming from there now in particular. But uh, the one that took it to the Philippines, there was two typhoons converged over Fukushima, right smack over Fukushima, picked up all the radiation throughout the country, liberating that with rain and evaporation and everything, carried it all the way down, knocked out 41 provinces in the Philippines, went over and whacked the daylights out of Vietnam, crossed that ocean again. It never even lost speed. Now, uh, this was like an F, I'm not sure, F2 tornado, F3 tornado, 200, 225 mile per hour winds. But uh, where they only last for a minute, maybe, or six minutes, and our uh -huh. quarter mile wide, this thing was 100 miles wide. Yeah, it was, it was huge. That was a tornado. Yeah, I know. 100 it's miles wide. Uh, unbelievable. No. Yeah, this was Fukushima. And because it's still hemorrhaging in the ocean, we can expect worse than that coming up in the future with the right conditions, and we're seeing that playing out. That's that blob. And so they're, they're alluding that it's still out there by saying, oh, but it's down 600 feet. Well, if it's down 600 feet, it's in, a, it's in an ice bucket, and it's, and it's in different salinities and there's different speeds, so it should rip itself apart. Just like they can tear a cloud apart by flying through it with airplanes. Then they can. Uh, that's what happens with the stuff in the ocean. That's what happens to the modeling and the plumes and everything else when it reaches different depths. It gets torn apart. And so, why isn't that happening? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the blob is still out there, and it's, it never stopped going in there, Jeff. The reactors haven't stopped. No, it's no, it hasn't. Of course not. I sent you the map. You can see it. It's, yeah, it's, no, it's, that's right. It's splitting right off uh, Washington, the North Pacific Current. Let me remind folks, we got just a minute left here. There is a product on my homepage. It's not a joke. It's called Bio Superfood, and I want you to click on that link. It's a blue link. You'll see my name on it. It was developed, created by Dr. Michael Kiriak after the Chernobyl disaster. It is comprised of the four most powerful, nutritious algaes on the planet carefully grown in Kamchatka, brought over here, encapsulated, and made available to you. I've been taking it every day for five years now, and it is the only thing that has ever been shown to mitigate, reverse, or otherwise ameliorate the effects 
of accumulated radiation from a nuclear disaster. It is also the most nutrition dense food you can consume. It will do so much for you. I'm not kidding. So if you want to protect yourself to the best that we can from radiation radioactivity, and after tonight's program, I hope you really start thinking about this because if it's in bivalves, it's in other species in the ocean. They're going to be slow to tell you. Don't eat anything from the ocean. In point of fact, you really got to stay the hell away from, from the ocean. Go look at it. I wouldn't get in it. Not anymore. Anyway, Bio Superfood on the homepage at Rents. It's a blue banner. Take a look. Dana, anything to add for this uh, program? We really covered some important material tonight. No, we, we've done really good. Hugs for everybody. Hugs for the crew there and you, Jeff, and hugs for Yoshi. Thanks. Take care, folks. So thanks, Dana. Good night. You're welcome, my friend. Take care. Dana Dernford, uh, truly a heroic man. Uh, Yoshi is uh, in Asia. Be back next week or the week after. And we will continue for you tomorrow night. See you then.